Did you know that most structural failures occur in the foundation systems and the soil that they're sitting on? They've literally failed before they've got out of the ground. Foundation systems are unsung heroes of structural design and it's important that you don't overlook them. They're also one of the aspects that most people complain about as they're seen as sunk costs below the ground that don't add any benefit to the building. I'll walk you through the fundamentals of foundation design, what a shallow foundation is, what a deep foundation is, and some of the key aspects that you need to know. And there will be a bonus at the end that will help you design these foundations more effectively, quicker, making your designs better. So whether you're a student, practicing, or an architect that wants to look into a little bit more information about foundations, this video is for you. My name is Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. So what are the type of foundation systems that you have? They really sit into two camps. You have a shallow foundation system and a deep foundation system. A shallow foundation system, example of these is a strip footing, a pad footing, a raft or a slab on ground. A raft can sit a number of different camps. You either have a straight raft, waffle slab or a stiffened raft but they all fundamentally fall into the same category that they're bearing on soil. Don't need anything below it. And the soil is quite good and it has sufficient bearing capacity. So they're either a smaller building or have really good soil that you can bear on. Whereas a deep foundation system, this is a pile, a pier, a diaphragm wall, screw piles, there's many different types. You need to found your foundation deeper than the soil it's sitting on. There's a number of different reasons why you may do this. Firstly, maybe the building is really big and the loads are way too high. So you need to go down to either a more solid foundation or bedrock to bear the loads. When you do drill a pile down, it does mean that it also needs to take both the bearing on the bottom, but also skin friction on the side to help resist those loads. Or for example, you may be in a place susceptible to liquefaction which is where the ground turns to liquid underneath a seismic event. So it means that you need to put foundations deeper so make sure your building doesn't sink during those seismic activities. Do you know the foundation systems that are on your home? Or what type of foundation systems have you seen in construction? Comment below. And if you're living in a standard house, it's most likely a shallow foundation system made of strip footing and pad footings. But why don't you check it out? What are the key concepts of foundation design? We have loads, we have bearing capacity and settlement. Let's start with bearing capacity and settlement, and then we'll get onto loads. So bearing capacity is really quite simple. It's the bearing that the soil takes. So you put a bit of pressure onto it. It's the pressure that it can take, but how much can it take? That's really key. And it comes down to settlement. Settlement is how much the foundation settles underneath the applied load. So these really go hand in hand. Based on your allowable settlement, you'll get your allowable bearing capacity. And this is key to the name for the next one that we're gonna talk about is loads. You see, foundation designs is all about what settlement you can achieve underneath what load. And when you're thinking about the different types of loads and movements, what are you thinking about? You're thinking about a serviceability load, not an ultimate load. So typically when you're doing foundation designs, you're making sure that you're doing a serviceability load, not an ultimate load, which would be way too conservative. It's all about movements and settlements. Now, there's a couple of key aspects that you do need to watch out for because sometimes you do have an ultimate bearing capacity, which is typically taken for your seismic events as you do want to make sure your building doesn't fundamentally fail underneath a higher load. So you'll have a higher bearing capacity that you have allowed for, for those ultimate seismic loads, but that will mean there will be more movement underneath that event. But provided your building stands up, you don't really care at this point. Another key aspect that you do need to watch out for is expansive soils. See, expansive soils means they shrink and swell underneath different seasonal activities. So it's also based on where you're located and how much you go between dry and wet will also increase the expansiveness of the soil that you need to watch out for. But you can have movements of upwards of 70 millimeters, meaning that your footings need to be so much stiffer underneath those loads and your foundations need to be designed for it. In expansive clays, typically you're not allowed to have isolated pad footings because the movements are so great, typically you need to tie them in together. Another thing that's potentially unique about foundation systems is that if you're in a colder environment, you do need to worry about the frost line. So what is the frost line? The frost line is the depth at which the soil freezes. And typically when water freezes, it expands, you wanna make sure that your foundation systems are below that expansive line to make sure you're setting on a foundation system that doesn't move underneath those seasonal activities. Now, you do need to watch out for your local areas 
and look at your local codes and that will give you what depth the frost line is to make sure your foundation systems are below that point. So let's run into a quick example of a pad footing and sizing it up. In this case, we have 2000 kilonewtons from the load rundown that we've done from above and we're applying it onto a really good soil. So we've got 300 kPa here. So first up, we need to get the approximate area of that foundation. So it's just that 2000 kilonewtons divided by 300 kPa and it roughly gets us about 6.7 square meters or in other terms, 2.6 by 2.6 square. That's not where we need to stop. You see, we also need to size up that foundation system as it has a specific depth and that depth of concrete has a weight to it. So it can potentially reduce the bearing capacity that you're allowed or increase the load, whichever way you want to look at it. So it means that you need to have a bigger foundation. So at 2.6 by 2.6 meters square, how deep does your foundation need to be? As a rule of thumb, you roughly want to make sure that your load spreads at about a 45 degree angle. So that means at 2.6 by 2.6, you divide that by two, that's 1.3 meters deep. A 1.3 meters deep foundation system is roughly about 30 kilonewtons per square meter. So that means you have a 10% reduction in bearing capacity because you already have 30 kPa applied to it. If we back calculate the numbers, we can see that we need to increase the footing slightly bigger. So now we go by 2.7 by 2.7. Now, what reinforcement do we need in that foundation system? It's really quite easy. You see, it's just a strut and tie method that allows you to spread out that load in two directions. So we strut and tie the load out and that's where we put the mat of reinforcement in the base. There's no tension force at the top, but there is tension at the bottom and that's typically where we need to reinforce. Sometimes you put stuff in the top because you wanna stop cracking, but most of the time you need your foundation system to be having reinforcement in the base. If you look at the calculation, you see it's got some handy units to it. The units will make sure that you're doing the calculation correctly and converting it back into the units that you're expecting. When we're going back for a square area, we can see we're calculating back to a square area. When we're calculating for an area of steel, we can see that we're getting an area of steel out of it. That way we can have more confidence that we've done the numbers correctly. So what are the, some of the key mistakes that people make when they're designing foundations? Well, some of them, they potentially don't see those eccentric loads. Just so you have a column on the edge of your side. So that means your pad footing needs to be offset to it. That load is no longer in the center. It's offset to one side. So it leads to an eccentric load that you need to deal with. So you need to make sure that you're oversizing that foundation system for that eccentric load, which will make it bigger for the load that's applied to it. Or maybe you do need to look at a pile system. If you are doing a pile system here, watch out what you're doing over the side. If you've got a pile system on one side, but not a pile system on the other, they're sitting on different ground. So it means they'll get differential movement that could potentially be detrimental to your building. Yes, it might be good here, but is it good over there? So you might be more efficient to do a pad footing, even though it's eccentric on the edge of your building, as you don't need to design pile foundation systems around the rest of your structure. Also, don't neglect those lateral forces. As we're looking at the serviceability load, it can be quite common to overlook the lateral system. The lateral system does need to bear down onto the ground, so you need to transfer those loads all the way from above into the foundation system to make sure that they're effectively resisted. And don't go about guessing that. Another key mistake is some people might be going, well, I've just designed the site next to us, so this site should be okay. Now, some of the times that is correct, but some other times it's not. I've had one site that was sitting on solid rock when we went across just the next door neighbors. It was sitting on shallow foundation systems that needed to be quite deep because of the soil conditions. That was because the rock had dropped off at that point because of a fissure. It means that the site on one side was sitting on a solid foundation of rock. The other one needed quite deep foundation systems because of the reactive soil that it was sitting on. Or looking at the different types of foundation systems, some people think that the deep foundation systems may be more expensive than the shallow foundation system. Depending on what you're doing, yes, that can be the case. But if you're doing it in the right way, such as screw piles, I've had them replace stumps. Stumps are one of the most cheapest foundation systems that you can have. You have a concrete stump down, you put the timber over the top. But if you do it at a screw piles, you can achieve something very similar if you've got poor soil. Those reactive soils are also highly susceptible to movement or shrinking and swelling. So if you clear the site full of trees, it's creating a differential in the moisture condition in the site. So those trees cutting them down could actually be detrimental to your foundation design. Even though most people think that tree is sucking water out, it's bad, let's cut it down. But now that you've cut it down, you do need to wait a while until the soil and moisture conditions have settled down from removal of that tree. Typically it's a couple of seasons. 
so you do need to be careful. And you just don't want to over-design those foundation systems. Yes, it may mean that your building's sitting on a really solid foundation and it won't fall down, but potentially you're throwing a lot of money and a lot of embodied carbon to somewhere where it doesn't need to be. We're structural engineers. Do what you get paid for. Design a foundation system that's not either over-designed or under-designed. It's both a bad either way that you do it. I've shared in the below description a link to the MathDot calculation that I presented above. MathDot is a software that I've helped co-found. And if you did enjoy this video, I've got a link to the fundamental design of foundation designs that you will like. And if you want to support the channel more, there's two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube or Patreon member. Without the support of my YouTube and Patreon members, this type of content would not be possible. As always, keep learning, and I'll see you in two weeks.